Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in Tube Lab number 78, we're going to take another look at how to achieve great sound. And we're going to look at the power amp. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, this week, no, that's not right. The last month has been so busy, I thought yesterday was Thursday. <laughs> oh, well, these things happen. So, I've done a number of episodes talking about how to achieve great sound. We started back with the music or source material and move forward with our last episode a while back looking at the preamp. Today we're going to look at the power amplifier. Now we call it a power amplifier because that's what it does. It powers up the signal with enough current to drive our transducers, also known as speakers. Okay, let's just look at a pure class A monoblock a monoblock is just a single channel power amplifier. For stereo, you need a matched pair of them. And if we have two channels inside one box, it's called a stereo amplifier. And if we include the preamp as well, we call the whole shebang an integrated amp. Okay, everybody got that? <laughs> There'll be a quiz at the end. Um, so we're going to look at the schematic because really we're talking about electrically uh, what makes for great sound but it's good to look at the physical amp so this is this is the Yuri uh, pure class A monoblock and here's your here's your your power supply your power transformer here's your output transformer here's your power tube and here's your driving tube and we'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. This is about as simple as it gets. In a, in a small tabletop radio or a small TV, you could actually find tubes that have a driver stage and an amplifier stage inside one tube envelope. But for quality audio that's driving a loudspeaker, you're not going to see that. We've just got a simple IEC inlet, a pair of speaker jacks, what we really want to do is look at the electrics, right? <clears throat> so we have a power supply board, filter choke. All of this basically is doing is getting us, a, taking the AC wall mains, whatever the voltage is, and we're converting it to clean, high-powered DC. All electronics basically run on DC electrics. The signal, our audio signal, is a very low voltage AC. Okay, so over here we've got the the driver stage. Now a driver is just a preamp tube for a power tube. That's all it is. It raises the voltage further than the preamp does to a point that the power tube likes. That's all. Over here we have the power tube. Think of the power tube along with the output transformer. Here's the primary feed from the output transformer. The two of them really work together. And let's grab the schematic and go deep into it. Okay, let's just zoom in here so, so everybody can see what's going on. go and I got a pointer here somewhere so this is pure class A now what do we mean by pure class A well when we say pure we mean there's no feedback and I'll show you where the feedback would be in a minute class A just means that the tubes are running 100% duty cycle they're always on and they're always working even if there's no signal that's why they get so bloody hot. Now, the big, the big difference between Class A and Class AB is that in Class A, we don't 
split the signal into positive and negative phases and amplify them. Now, that's a discussion for another episode, but the vast majority, maybe more than 90% of amp, tube amps out there are class AB, and they'll split the phase, and one tube will amplify the positive phase, and the other tube will amplify the negative phase. You get a lot more power in class AB, which is why it's used so much, and you also get a very low noise amp. But class AB, when it gets rid of the noise, also gets rid of a lot of the magic because it eliminates much of the second harmonics that really make it, our sound come alive, in my opinion. Okay, let's look at what a class A amp circuit looks like. Here's our RCA in. We come into the, the grid of V1, which is our driver tube. We raise the voltage from the low preamp voltage. We take it off of the plate. We go through a coupling capacitor. All that capacitor does is it keeps the high voltage from crossing over. Capacitors, coupling capacitors allow the AC signal. You see it over here as a little sine wave. Allow the AC signal to pass, but it blocks the block DC. That's what they're that's what they're there for. When you take the signal off the plate, it inverts. You see how the signal now is on the negative phase. That's a, a nominal presentation, right? It got larger as well because we amplified it. We put it back onto the onto a, the grid of the power tube V2. In which case, this is the 6P7S. This is a Really, it's a beautiful looking tube, but it's a wonderful sounding um, tetrode. It's a beam powered tetrode, very much along the lines of a 6L6. But it's got a top cap, and it's a, it was designed for um, cathode ray tubes, uh, for TV sets, for things like that. It just happens to be a great performing tube in audio as well. And there's a lot of examples of tubes that were made for other applications like radi radar or TV um, or even transmitters that work great in audio. So the signal goes in on the grid. We take it off of the plate again. This is a cathode bias tube, otherwise known as an auto bias tube. I prefer cathode bias because it's it's a good it's a more descriptive way of of how it's biased. Um, and when people use the word auto biasing, what they're really trying to say is that we can plug tubes of a similar type and a similar um, current into this slot, and the tube will work just fine. In a fixed biased amp you actually adjust the bias to the spec. So the, the, the naming isn't quite descriptive, I think. But anyways, that's, it's what it is. Here's our high voltage, B+. We've got 315 volts. It supplies the plate of our driver stage. And it powers up our output tube or power tube. Notice how the the high voltage passes right through the primary side of our output transformer. This is the primary side. The signal is modulated again as the current passes through the tube and the signal ends up on this side of it much larger with a lot of current behind it. Whatever the tube's set for and capable of pushing, right? Remember for most stages, we want voltage gain when we're bringing a small signal up. But when we're at the output stage, we don't want voltage. What we want is current. And that's what our output transformer does so well with us. For us, it takes a high current, high voltage, high impedance signal, and it reduces it to a low impedance, in this case, 8 ohms or 4 ohms, high current, very low voltage through the magic of our, our output transformer. So what you're not seeing in this circuit is feedback. 
Feedback could be on a tap right here, and it would come back here to um, the screen grid of V2. Now here, I forgot to mention, but here we're, we're in triode mode permanently in this design. And what that is, is, is an attempt to get the tube as close to triode operation as possible. And we strap it permanently through a small value resistor, only 100 ohm. And it would be better to call it a quasi-triode than a true triode, because it's, it is a beam-powered tetrode. It's my, triode strapped is my favorite sound. Now, I listen to a lot of acoustic music, to uh, world jazz, to small ensemble. Um, I have very high efficiency, uh, very revealing speakers, open baffles that I really love dearly. I have a very small listening room, so I'm, I'm not near field listening, but I'm getting fairly close to it. And, um, Class A, with no feedback, uh, with a triode strapped output stage, that's, that gives me an immediacy of sound. In fact, if you want to try to understand, without listening to it, it's, it's hard. But if you want to try to understand why audiophiles love Class A above all else, think about the sound as being a very present, immediate sound. It's, it's a very quick sound. It's a very clear sound. It's a very clean sound. Now, why are we getting that clarity and that immediacy? Why are the mid-range vocals so absolutely amazing and stunning? What's going on with Class A that the more common Class AB doesn't do? Well, Class AB will often have feedback. Feedback is just where you take a portion of the output signal from from it can be from over here on the on the secondary side on the speaker side of the transformer it can be over here you can have a 40 percent tap coming down here like this you could take either one of these and feed it back to any previous stage um, and it's fairly common to take something off of here and bring it all the way back to the driver stage now feedback can give you more power or it can give you less depending on how it's set up if you're feeding back off the tap to here to the power tube, you can get a lot more power. It can reduce noise. Feedback is great at doing that. But it also messes, in my opinion, with the phase. Here we have a pure signal in which we haven't split the phase like you would in a Class AB push-pull amp. We don't touch it at all other than to give it some voltage gain, drive our tube, send out our, our send out our signal and in my opinion avoiding feedback if possible going class a and avoiding splitting the phase those are all things you can do to achieving great sound now the biggest drawback by far of class a is that even the big amps only go up to something like 10 watts and those are huge amps. Um, they're big, they're hot, they're expensive. The Yuri is a solid two watts continuous duty. And so that's an honest, it's an honest two watt amp. It can drive easily um, any efficient speaker system up to loud listening volumes. In fact, when I did the live, in, in person live, volume test just to see how loud it could get just for fun really but it's a test that every amp needs to be done you just crank it up basically and see how it performs i had to wear hearing protection that's how loud it got okay what has been happening over at melatone kits well lots i shipped two universal 6 or 12 sn7 kit preamps to test builders last week and that means we only need one more test builder. I also heard back from the final URI test builder. I thought maybe he was sending me a note to say he'd receive the kit safe and sound. Given that I'd only just shipped them the kits two weeks ago. But no, he was finished. <laughs> well, at least he was finished the first of the URIs. Um, and he had zero problems. 
and like all test builders, he had some excellent suggestions on how to improve the kits even further. Anyway, now that the Universal Pre's will be arriving shortly at test builders, we're going to start filming the new build series starting Monday. And it takes about two weeks start to finish. <clears throat> and um, I work with Charles on this. He's the He does the editing and he drops the cards into, the, you know, the little things you see on the screen. I call them cards. I don't know if there's another name for them. He, he drops those into the screen for us. He gets it all organized and he, he gets it up onto, onto YouTube. He's really good at the, doing that. And um, the, um, we're going to hopefully be able to stay ahead of the test builders because they, their pre's won't be arriving probably until later this coming week. So we should already have um, the first few episodes in the can uh, and published. Okay, well, lots of stuff came in this week, so hang on. Hang on. It's going to take me a second to get it all out. Oh, I had this lying around. Have a look at this. Here's the top plate. Oh, we better back up. Here's the top plate for the Universal 6 or 12 SN7. Isn't it beautiful? Um, now, the, all of the early uh, top plates are completely hand machined. So I, I, I do everything with a, a drill press and hand finishing tools. And it takes a long time. And that's why Charles is working hard in getting the CNC up and running because it'll be able to do uh, a third of a full 4x8 sheet. I forget how many plates we get out. 20, 20 some plates, I think, per third, something like that. We get a lot of plates, anyways. It might be closer to 30. I forget. Anyways, we get a lot of plates out of each one of the sheets. So, one of the things I've learned to do is to mark the downside because. You want to start building on the top <laughs> if you don't ever want to do it the other way around. Okay, so I met up with a really nice fellow this week and we did a deal. I don't normally do trades, but he was interested in the prototype Universal 6 or 12 SN7 Pre. He said he wasn't, his arthritis would prevent him from building a kit from scratch. And I thought, well, we're almost done with the prototype. I'm going to have kit number one is what I'll be building this over the next couple of weeks. So I, I could do a trade for some tubes and he brought some wonderful tubes. Here's, a, here's one of the flights of Sylvania 6SL7s, one of my favorite 6SL7s of all time. This is a later version. You can see we've got the yellow print. The earlier one is green. Interestingly enough, in the last years of production when Phillips had bought Sylvania, they actually switched back to a Phillips green. So don't let that fool you. But the very early Sylvanias all have a very distinctive kind of a soft green. So there you go. They're tall boys with a big, big chrome dome. Got the oval offset black plates. These are wonderful sounding tubes. They're warm and rich sounding. They have that Sylvania house sound. They sound great in the Wilsonton R8. And uh, my general rule is great tubes will sound great or good at least in pretty much any slot you put them in. And bad tubes, they just sound bad everywhere. <laughs> okay, so a bunch of these came in. They'll be in the store eventually. They have to get tested. Often when I bring in sleeves like this, We've got, we're going to have good matches because they're all made at the same time. Now, many of you know that one of my favorite tubes of all time is the metal base melts. Let's zoom in here. We're way out. There we go. So let's look at some of them. Here is the melts equivalent to the 6SL7, the tube we just looked at. Um, let's see if you can see the label. It's, they're really quite pretty labels, but they're really faint. Even brand new versions are faint. Uh, it's it's a light etched label, I think. Um, and uh, Phillips and Mullard use those for manufacturing codes. And again, we have a problem with them rubbing off and being faint. But here we've got uh, 453. So 
April of 1953. These are great sounding tubes. A lot of the metal based melts tubes are prone to being noisy, so the failure rate at the testing stage is high. Once I get a good tube ready for a customer that sounds, tests good, sounds good, and is nice and quiet, they tend to stay good. But it's well worth keeping in mind to look after them, to be careful. One of the things I keep forgetting to mention is with vintage tubes, any tube, gear, period, don't switch with your volume up. In fact, if you have an old school setup in which everything is analog, your volume control, your switches are not, are not digital, then you can go ahead and turn off your gear, switch your equipment to a different selector or a tone control, whatever, and then turn it back on. Your volume should be down. Never start up a piece of equipment with the volume up. And if you have a digital equipment and you want to switch, let's say, the selector over, or if you have an amp that has triode and ultra linear mode, UL mode, um, on it like the Wilsonton R8 does, for God's sake, don't hit that button with the music playing and the volume up. Bring your volume down to zero and then hit that digital switch and that'll reduce the, the shock that these tubes get if they get whacked with a high voltage surge. Okay, that's something to keep in mind. Here's the uh, Melts 6SN7GT equivalent. These also are wonderful sounding tubes, but they're the lower spec GT. Very much, very similar to the Sylvania Bad Boys. Elevated black T plates, big waist chrome, foil getter. M most likely they were copied from either the Marconi or the Sylvania. The Sylvania probably copied the Marconi, or you know, purchased the rights to build from the from the patent holder. I don't know exactly who had the patent for that type. The main patent holders for early tubes included RCA, and RCA, of course, the foundation of RCA was Marconi USA. So it could have been Marconi, and RCA acquired those rights. Uh, it could be uh, uh, Sylvania, Sylvania licensed them, and it could be they, you know, legally stole them. Who knows? There was an awful lot of copying of technology back then, just like today. So these can't, because of the lower spec, they can be played in, in a preamp like my Universal 6 or 12 SN7 because it's designed to play every 6 SN7 and 12 SN7 ever made and close variations. Modern preamps like the Freya and modern amps like the Wilsonton R8 challenge many of these GT tubes. And what they do is they operate them at a little bit too high of a voltage. Maybe the, the bias setting is a little bit too high. Maybe when the tubes were brand spanking new 70 years ago, they could handle that, maybe. But today, they're 70 years old. <laughs> many of them are used, and many of them will get noisy if you try them. Some will survive. There's no set rule as to which ones do and which ones don't. But I, I would suggest not using them. There's no warranty if you do. Some of my customers take a chance and get away with it. Now, I bought thousands of dollars worth of tubes and lots and lots of tubes from a seller in uh, one of the former Soviet republics, uh, Kazakhstan, I think. A really nice guy, does good business, packages and ships promptly and extremely well. Does a good job all around. And I must have ordered so much stuff that he was kind enough to put a matched pair of the ultimate 6SN7 ever made. This is the Meltz 1578. You can always tell them apart. Let me get the other one up here. See the difference in the plate structure? The one with all the holes is the 1578. And... These are just amazing sounding. They're very high spec. They, they must have been made for some really tough military duty or factory duty or space duty. Who knows? Um, but they not only are they very durable, but they sound amazing as well. And they're, they're incredibly rare. And as a result, they're very expensive. So I actually now have two matched pairs in the store, believe it or not. And uh, I only have one in the store 
I had one in the store because I finally decided that I couldn't hoard. Uh, somebody accused me of hoarding <laughs> last month. And I thought, well, I don't hoard anything. And then I, I found them in my stash. And I said, well, okay, I was hoarding a pair of these. So I put them up for sale. So somebody else can enjoy them. Okay, I saved the best to last. We've got to move fast, though. Let's back out. It's a big box. Well, it's not that big. This came double box, so there was a, there was a, so, a soft packed uh, plastic wrapping. There was a box. Then there was bubble wrap around this box, and then there was this box. And it's warranted because what's inside here is treasure. Came all the way from Japan. The seller wrote me a beautiful note, put some green tea in. Japanese sellers are always doing things like that, and I love them for it. And no, you can't expect me to send you some green tea. Okay, so it was just exquisitely wrapped. I've already been in here once, so it's not as neat. <laughs> it only took me a couple of trips into the box, and it's messy. <laughs> but look what's in here. A nice, nice pile of my favorite KT-88 type power tubes. The true vintage Svetlana 6550C. And I say true because there's lots of fakes out there. First thing you should look for is the holes or ventilation holes in the plate structure. The true one are rectangular, the fakes are all round. So you want square is good, round is bad. <laughs> and that goes for the KT-88 type. All of the Svetlana big power tubes were all copied by a manufacturer that punched round holes. I'll let you guess who that was. Anyways, these all have a little dimple on top. They have metal bases, of course, which is common in the KT-80 type. The good news is that finally I have enough of these in stock that the packages for the Wilsonton R8 that I call the Svetlana Golds are finally back in stock. People have been waiting for them. There's not enough that I'll probably sell them separately. There's just so much demand for complete sets for the Wilsonton. Um, so they're going to they're gonna be in the store now. And um, uh, until they're gone, I guess. I, I don't know how else to say it. Power tubes are still a problem. EL34s, KT88, 6550s, even the 6V6, there's still a shortage of them. And uh, I can always tell when there's a shortage because I'll get people who normally buy new from wholesalers buying out my inventory. So there you go. Okay, if you stayed till the end. Here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got $20 flat rate shipping around the world. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Have fun, everyone. This is Jim from Bells and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.